Um, I'm at the University of Houston. I'm an assistant professor in math education. So I prepare people that become math teachers or that are math teachers. And so I'm gonna try to, I'm gonna spin it a little bit. Um, so the need that we've kind of identified that um, um, we focus on is that we know that low income schools, that students have less than a 50% chance of having a math teacher who holds birth certification and a degree in the subject. And that we know that that actually really matters and that um, studies indicate that teachers taught by students with math degrees or math education background actually learn more. And I'll talk a little bit about what I mean by more and how that matters. And we know that um, students being prepared in STEM fields is really, really important. And so um, I'm gonna talk about middle school and then I'll, I'll nod towards elementary a little bit too. But the typical middle school math teacher profile is that they're certified as generalists, right? And so what that means in our school is we actually don't currently do the generalist certificate in 4-8 we have a 4-8 math and a 4-8 science. That means that instead of taking one math methods class that teaches them how to teach m all of math that covers all of grades four through eight, right? So we're talking about a big giant chunk of math. Um, they have a three-part series. They take teaching math in grades four through eight, developing proportional reasoning, and then a class specifically on algebra and geometry. And so we actually take seriously that they actually not only need to know the math, but actually need to know how to teach it. Um, and because, the, and, and when and generalists also usually have very fragile math content knowledge, they also, their pedagogical knowledge is also limited by math, their math knowledge. And so if you actually don't know the math, then it's actually really hard to teach it. And lots of people, I know it seems obvious, but lots of people actually believe that if I actually just like students, and if I'm really nice, and if I smile a lot, then that can cover up right, the fact that I'm actually not very skillful in math or that I didn't like math or I didn't do very well in it. And we actually have a lot of evidence that it's actually, that's not true, right? And so it actually does matter and it matters in um, important ways. The other thing is that um, across the board, there's a very fragile understanding about what it means to teach diverse learners. And when Dr. Schott asked me, he said, so, you know, what would you, what do you think we need to do in Houston to become a STEM leader? And I said, until we take seriously the work of what it really means to educate a diverse population, we have no chance. We have no chance based on who's in, who is in Houston now. If we don't take that seriously, it's not even possible. And so he said, oh good, do you want to be on a panel? <laughs> and so, um, um, so that's why I'm here today. So teachers are key. And so instead of just saying that it really kind of matters how teachers are important, there are actually studies about teacher quality um, that say that um, there's a 12 to 14% of the variability in students' math gains in one year, right? And that there's a 10% difference between the top quartile teachers and the bottom quartile teachers. And so what that means is that it actually matters what the teachers actually know about math to be able to be skillful teachers. And so the effects are compounded dramatically when teachers receive a series of effective or ineffective teachers. So for example, one of the studies says that in one year, one teacher can produce gains. So if you imagine the work of teaching is to, to help students a second grader. We want this second grader at the end of the year to be a third grader, right? So that the very minimum, they're supposed to get their kids to understand one entire year's worth of curriculum. We know that they don't always come all the way as second graders, right, when we have them. That doesn't change our goal of helping them be proficient by the end of second grade to be ready for third grade, right? And so what happens is there's a teacher, and based on how much they know about the math and how much they know about teaching the math, one teacher will produce three months of gains. That means a kid in their classroom will only learn about three months of what they need to go to the great next grade level. Actually though, a teacher that actually has a high level of mathematical knowledge can teaching can produce gains of up to a year and a half, right? So it actually does matter that teachers actually know um, the math that they're going to teach and how to teach the math. And so if you say that you have a kid, let's say they start in third grade, and their third grade teaches them is a low, is a, um, an effective teacher and only produces three months of gains. 
then in third grade they get a fourth grade they get a teacher that only does another three months in fifth grade so you see how it's compounded year after year after year so you have students starting middle school and if they've had a series of ineffective teachers they're years behind their peers and the problem is even though we think there are lots of things that happen in the community and lots of things that happen in families that matter they actually these kids actually came to school every day they came to school every day, did all of their homework, and still only learned this much of what they actually needed to know. So my, my main point that I'll keep reiterating is that any promise we have of becoming STEM leaders has to invest in teacher education. Teachers are the number one resource for student learning period, across the board. And so they are the ones uniquely responsible for increasing the probability that students learn important content and skills and gain at least a year's worth um, of school each year. So um, how we kind of deliberately attend to that at the University of Houston is in elementary, we're redesigning our E6 to EC6 teacher preparation program to actually have two math methods courses instead of one, which it may not seem a lot, but it's double what, what teachers typically have. And they will also do year-round student teaching. And so we're um, deliberately trying to attend to this idea of helping them learn more about the math and more about how they need to teach math in the elementary grades, which we know are very, very, very important. And then we also have a 4-8. We're maintaining our 4-8 math certification and science certification instead of doing the generals for the um, reasons that I stated earlier. And then what I'm going to talk about is um, a nice kind of relationship that builds the first panel with the second panel. We have a 4-8 master math teacher certification program. And in our MMT program, it consists of four content courses, algebraic thinking, probability and statistics, geometry, algebra, and then one seminar course that's um, deliberately focused on, on preparing teachers for working in diverse classrooms. And 100% of our program is actually sponsored by the Society of Petroleum Engineers and Shell. And so one of the um, examples earlier today about how the, um, the corporations were supporting is that they're actually financially supporting the tuition and fees of these teachers who are going through our program. And so I'm going to skip over this a little bit to, in the interest of time, um, but this talks a little bit about what we do, and it's kind of on our website, so if you wanted to know, you could go and look. But one of the things that I wanted to talk about is one of the things that's really important to us and that is also important to Shell is that we're serving the students who actually depend on school for learning. There are some kids who go to school um, for socializing. My children kind of do that. They go to school to hang out with their friends and you know talk to people and they try to learn a little something while they're there, but they mostly have a good time, right? But we know that especially in Houston, lots of kids go to school for their opportunities to learn. For, to learn. Said another way, if we don't actually teach them and we don't cover at least a whole year, they don't have a chance. There's not somebody at home waiting to tutor them. They're not all these other kinds of things. They actually are depending on schools and their teachers for their actual life chances to be able to get, have access to higher education, to have access to these wonderful high paying jobs they talked about on the first panel. I mean, like they need schools to be able to do that. And in our program, we take that seriously. And so we're actually deliberately serving stu teachers who serve students who are in these classrooms, who serve students who need schools um, to learn. And so we have a high percentage of our teachers who are in Title I. We also um, um, have a high percentage of um, the students that are served by our teachers actually represent diversity in lots of different ways. And so this chart kind of gets at that. So now I'm going to turn to give you just a little slice of, of what it actually means to actually prepare somebody to teach math. And so teaching involves specialized mathematical work. It involves these three different kinds. It involves solving special kind of problems, engaging in math re reasoning, and then using mathematical language precisely but accessibly. And these are examples of what that looks like. But I actually have a problem for you to do. So teachers have to actually think carefully about how you pose a problem. So this is a problem. I have pennies, nickels, and dimes in my pocket. If I pull out two coins, what amount of money might I have? So give me an example. How much money might I have? Six cents. If I make, how would I make six cents? What, what two coins did I pull out? Six pennies. <laughs> Not six pennies. <laughs> a nickel and a penny, right? 
And so you, you think about the work that's involved in structuring this question. But these are three different versions of it that would actually position the students to actually work on it very differently, right? So I have pennies, nickels, and dimes in my pocket. If I pull out two coins, how many combinations are possible? The cognitive demand of that work is very different than the first. Teachers have to think of this. And they often don't times to get the luxury of having a really nice office to sit and think carefully. And they have to think in the moment, on their feet, in front of the kids. How can I pose a problem? How will students respond to the problem that I want? And how does that push towards the mathematical goal that I have? The other thing that teachers often have to do, oh, my formatting got slightly messed up, is to think about how to use examples, right? Which of the following lists would best assess whether your students understand decimal ordering, right? So you actually have to pick assessment examples and think, what do I get? And I'll, if I had more time, I'd let y'all work through this, but I'm just gonna tell you the answers, right? So you have to think, do I want to know that my students know place value all the way to the hundredths? Do I wanna know that they can tell the difference between whole numbers and parts of numbers? What's my reasoning? Where are my students? And so the things you think about is, is this a pre-assessment before I teach it? Is this after I taught it and I wanna see how great I did and see how much they know? Is this in the middle? And so there are lots of reasons that teachers need to pick examples, but it actually requires not only knowledge about the math, but also about the students to be able to do this kind of work. And then this is a really fun one that we won't have time to go through, but you see that the problem is the same, but that the students actually solved it very differently. And there are actually mathematical reasons for why the students chose to solve it. Part of it has to do with their understanding of place value. You remember the magical zero that you had to die in? Why is it magical, right? It's actually not magical, it's actually place value. But to actually know why you should move it over and how many places to move it over actually requires um, substantial mathematical knowledge and knowledge about who your students are and how they do it. And this is a kind of spin on the same thing. It's three different students who actually all got the right answer but working on it very, very differently. And teachers have to do all of these things in the moment. And so it's actually very, very complex work. And I know that engineering work is very complex too, but teaching work is actually very, um, has a lot of mathematical substance to it as well and actually requires a great, a lot of skill too. Um, in our program, we deliberately help teachers learn how to do this work. We help them learn how to do the mathematical work, the teaching work, and specifically how to make that work accessible for their students by focusing on teaching in equitable ways where equity is defined not as treating all kids the same, but making sure that every single kid in your class has access to the math that you're trying to teach. And so we think about what that looks like and we help them develop skills for being able to do that. In the program that's being funded by SPE and Shell, we have 16 teachers who are currently training in seven different schools on 11 campuses. Um, nine of those are Title I. So far in our, in our kind of young program, we've had um, 19 teachers at different and different campuses serving more than 6,000 different students. And so it actually does matter that we have these relationships between the corporations and the teacher and the kids because it, um, it helps to improve the overall um, stream of, um, of education. So my, my very short recommendations are, so policy reports that it, there have actually been some gains in 4-8 math, and so we actually should look at those and make sure that we continue those and make sure that they um, continue to improve. Um, closing performance gaps and working on um, what the needs and how to serve the needs of diverse learners is actually critically important, especially for Houston and the state of Texas. Um, college readiness, as Dr. Wimpleberg said, should be the goal of K-12 education, right? So all students should graduate from high school ready to be able to do college work. And college work is defined as being able to take college classes for college credit. Right? We lose $80 million in remedial um, classes, specifically on math. That's a lot of wasted time and a lot of wasted money. We need students that can finish school, ready to take college math, whether they choose to go or not. Our job is to make sure that they're ready. And so that's what I think that we need to do. And teacher education is the number one investment for us becoming the STEM leaders. Thank you. <laughs>